Resiliency in ministry is such an important topic, and that's exactly what we get into on this episode of Front Stage Backstage with my guest, New York Times bestselling author, John Eldridge. Now, I want you to be listening specifically for what John has to say about benevolent detachment. So powerful for pastors, especially if you're wrestling with burning out or perhaps even tapping out of ministry altogether. Are you ready? Let's go. Hello, friends, and welcome to Front Stage Backstage. I'm your host, Jason Day, and so excited to have you with us for this episode. We are all about encouraging and equipping pastors just like you to live healthy leadership, both in your ministry and in your life, that healthy, well-balanced leadership. And we are blessed to be a part of the Pastor Serve Network. And if you're watching us on YouTube, we encourage you to like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of these amazing conversations. If you're listening to us um, on your favorite podcast platform, be sure to subscribe as well, uh, because these conversations are very insightful. And I'm excited about today's conversation. We have the opportunity to be joined by none other than New York Times bestselling author and the founder of Wild at Heart Ministries. John Eldridge. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Jason. Great to be here. Yeah, it's so good to be chatting with you again, brother. And uh, you have been spending and focusing a lot of time here recently on the topic of resiliency. In fact, you have a, a new book that is being released very, very soon entitled Resilient, Restoring Your Weary Soul in These Turbulent Times. So we're excited to, to hear about that. But I've got to tell you, John, as I was reading through the book, um, I couldn't help, and I, I'd, I'd love to have some of your uh, feedback on this. I couldn't help but think about all the other books of yours um, that I've read over the years, the different teachings and the different things that you've kind of put out into the world and blessed the church with. And I was thinking, you know, there there seems like John has had a bit of this thread of resiliency hmm. through ev everything. And it, it made me think about the idea of, of resiliency as being a kind of a core part of what it means to follow Jesus, right? Yeah. And so, so as I was reading that, I was reflecting back on all of these other things that I have, uh, have read of yours. And so I'm just uh, curious, uh, where does kind of resiliency fit in when you look at the scope of your life and ministry? Um, how, does that, how does that kind of fit in and connect? That is a beautiful observation, Jason. I, I hadn't connected those dots myself, but now that you're naming it, of course, of course, because John 10, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. I, I think that the, I've spent a lot of time as a Christian therapist and, and then you know, doing retreats and an author and all that, thinking about how does God heal the human soul? How does he restore our humanity? And, and first, just helping people understand that the offer of the gospel goes way beyond forgiveness and, and to enter into the fullness of the life of God, how our humanity is healed through the life of God in us. Go, yeah, that's resiliency. That, right. that is the presence of God bringing us resiliency, yes, through this angle and this angle and this book. And yeah, that's... That's beautiful. Awesome, brother. Um, as I was kind of looking through this, one of the things that you brought up and kind of in the front end of the book, which I thought was was powerful, kind of kind of set the stage for everything for me, was you you made this differentiation between resiliency and reserves, which which I thought was powerful um, because there's a lot of talk um, coming out of the pandemic and and all the tensions that we've uh, been under for the last several years now of resiliency. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, there's lots of conversation about resiliency, but one of the things that you um, share is that resiliency is one thing, but really reserves tell the true story. So talk to us a little bit, especially from the perspective of, you know, kind of a pastor or ministry leader who we're trying to, to be resilient in our ministry, you know, in our own lives oh, and in, in the people that we're shepherding, yeah. right? So, yeah. so how does, what is that connectivity between resiliency and reserves? <clears throat> Yeah, let me let me first say I take my shoes off to pastors. I think you have the most difficult job on the planet. Um, the variety, like you are required to be amazing in so many ways, mm -hmm. relationally, 
spiritually, as a communicator, but also as a leader, kind of a CEO, but also like a real estate executive. I mean, it's just, <laughs> right. you know, you're supposed to be the, the uh, pundit, a, a commentator on global events. It, it's really pretty staggering what we expect of people in ministry these days. Um, and so the difference is this, in order to overcome something like a global pandemic, you rally. Um, and, and what was the Christianity Today survey that I saw, I was back in November, 40% of pastors have thought about leaving the ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because of the crazy and the, you know, the vaccines, no vaccines, masks, no masks, all that stuff. So in order to rise to the moment and to, to overcome the challenges, you tap into your reserves. It's what we do. And you do this for good things. You do it for, you know, a birth of a child or a wedding. You know, you right. do it to overcome, you know, a new career challenge, anything like that. Go back and get your graduate work. Okay. We tap into our reserves. Um, but at some point, you have to replenish those reserves. They don't just naturally replenish. And I think, I think we've done a good job of rallying. I really do. People have done well. We've remained kind and loving and civil through a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, but in order to do that, we have tapped pretty deeply into our soul's reserve tanks. And, and a way to assess that is to just, let me just ask you, if a new pandemic were to start tomorrow <laughs> and we found ourselves exactly in the same position we did two years ago in, in March, what would, your, what would your reaction to that be? Right, yeah. right, okay. yeah. Or if your house burns down and right. everybody survives, everybody's okay, but you lose everything, all your documents and your precious things and the photos and stuff, you have to start over. How would you feel? Mm. You go, oh, okay, yeah. Um, because those things require your reserves. And so the idea of resiliency, um, one of the things that differentiates it, I, I was just reading Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3 about God strengthening us in our inmost being by his spirit within us. Resiliency, as the Christian understands it, is something that is imparted mm. into our inmost being by God and by the presence of God. And so I, 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 that's very hopeful for one thing. This isn't, hey, we just gave you a gym membership. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Uh, people don't need more to do. What we need is to be able to tap into, replenish our reserves by the presence of the living God. That's good. In, in us. Yeah, that, that, that's really good. You know, um, John, after enduring ongoing stress and tension, as we have, um, you shared that, that sometimes we, we think, you know, coming out of that, that we're going to return to the joy of what once was, right? That, that somehow we'll be able to kind of get back to that. Um, but, but you say that it really doesn't work that way, right? We, we don't have just a big um, reboot button for our lives. You know, we can't just take three months and go to Bali and, and you know, get restored and, and just, uh, you know, hit that reset. Um, instead we are faced with, you know, as pastors, Sunday comes once a week, right? <laughs> and, and in between Sundays, there's a lot of, you know, it's kind of the everyday ongoing yes. life. Yes. Um, so talk to us a little bit about that. Cause you, cause you mentioned that, um, whenever we come out of stress, you know, we we're, we're hopeful that we'll get to catch our breath, but then oftentimes at least a disappointment because we realize we're just back in the throes of life. Right, right. Yeah, part of the global denial right now is that these two years have not been traumatizing. And so it's kind just to say, look, the reason your congregation's acting out, you know, the substance abuse and the divorces and the affairs and all that is because everybody just went through global trauma, including you, friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, right. right. So it's very kind to name that and say, whoa, whoa, this is not just a quick reset. We, we actually are going to have to be intentional to recover, replenish, find resiliency. Because I, 
I would love to tell you that, hey, everybody, it's smooth sailing ahead, <laughs> right? But we were literally at the two-year anniversary of the pandemic when Russia invaded Ukraine. And, and on and on it goes. Now we've right. got, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is heating up again and the stuff going on in Yemen. And whoa, like the world is a heartbreaking place. And so <laughs> after you've been through trauma, what you do is self-soothing behavior. Okay, everything from healthy stuff like, <laughs> oh, I just, you know, I'm going to Hawaii with my family, right. to not so healthy stuff like pornography and, you know, alcohol abuse and that sort of thing. Uh, notice where your soul is going for relief right now. Okay. No, that's good. It'll be a really helpful thing to just gauge that. Notice where you're going for relief and make sure it is something from God that mm -hmm. actually replenishes your reserves. Because I, I'll be honest, I found myself drinking more mm -hmm. as the pandemic wore on. And then as the next thing and the politics and the tensions and all that. And I was talking to a therapist friend of mine who's a brilliant trauma therapist. And he confessed it to me. He says, I'm, I'm drinking wine with every meal now. And we looked at each other and said, bro, this is not good. Like, right. this, does, <laughs> this does not have a good future on it. So, you know, we both like backed off. But where are you going for relief? And will that replenish your reserves? Yeah, that, that's that's great. Um, I, know, I know you talk about this idea, and this is exactly what you're discussing right now, but um, getting getting our thirst back for the fountain of life. I, I love that phrase that you use in the book. And I know that's kind of what you're driving at is, you know, this idea that where where are we being replenished? But let's let's dig in just a little bit more on that um, in regard to the fountain of life, because there's yeah. a lot of hope in that phrase. Right. Oh, there's there's so there's a lot of beauty there. So so talk to us a bit about how how we um, when we're like you said, wearing so many different hats and trying to juggle so many different things. And we ourselves personally, you know, in ministry, we're going through things ourselves. We're also carrying burdens for our people. Um, what, what does that, you know, that thirst for the fountain of life look like? Man, <clears throat> this is so good. So, you know, gang, that the ancient battle <laughs> for the human heart is over this issue. Where do we turn for life? Where do we turn for life? And when the prophets are really railing, it is because we, they say, you have forsaken me, the fountain of life, right? And you've gone off into the wilderness pursuing right. your own versions. Okay, <clears throat> so let me, let me make an observation. Christians are amphibians. Well, all, all people are, but Christians especially are meant to be. We are amphibians. We live in two worlds at the same time. We're meant to have a comfortability with that. And this is a fascinating thing. If you take a real amphibian, a frog, <clears throat> and you put it only in a tank of water, it will drown. Mm. If you take a frog and you put it only in a terrarium with no water, All right, yeah. okay, it will die. Okay, it needs to move between both worlds, just as we do. And the, the, the problem is the, the human world, the natural world, the, everything from your Instagram, you know, to your kids' education, just the chaos of normal life crowds out our time spent and, and our facility with, right, the rest of God's kingdom, the supernatural world, tapping into something like the river of life. So the river of life flows from God to his people. And in John 7, Jesus says, it's going to flow through you. As you love me, as you believe in me, springs of living water right, are going to flow right. from your inmost being. Okay, it, it is the very presence of God in us. And so I think we just have to be aware of, I'm an amphibian. Most of my life is dominated by this world, this reality technology and chaos and demands and meetings and emails, <laughs> and, you know, all the crazy stuff. Where am I enjoying the rest of the kingdom of God? Where am I enjoying his presence enough that I am actually experiencing some of that water of life 
sort of saturating my inmost being so that I can thrive, so, so that I can live, because everything is designed to strangle that out of you, right? The whole mess of this planet is designed to just strangle that and right. keep you in the chaos. Yeah, that, that's good. Um, as we kind of think through that, as you were speaking there, John, I was thinking um, about as, as people in ministry, Oftentimes, the um, you were spending a lot of time with "quote unquote" God or godly things, right? But that doesn't always refresh us. You were talking about the enjoying, you know. You're talking about the beauty of it, um, but oftentimes in ministry, it becomes more of a, a task in a way. It's part of part of our job description, you know. It's part of just what we do. So, how can pastors? Uh, you know, be attentive to experiencing that that joy that you're talking about, the the enjoyment, mm. the pleasure. Um, what what are some of those supernatural graces that you talk about that can help help us get to those those beautiful places? Mm. Okay, <clears throat> so um, let's clarify a couple of things because I've spent I spent my career in ministry. Right. I know exactly what you're talking about, <laughs> and, and I've served on the staff of a local church, so. Um, God activity is not the same thing as being replenished by God. Amen. Okay? So, yep. you know, good, good meetings, good purposes, conferences, pouring into people's lives, sessions, prayer for people, all that is not the same thing as being replenished by God. Enjoying That's his good. presence, enjoying his conversation, what he's revealing you, what he's showing you, all that. So, but then we get to the end of our day and we're like, I'm just so done with spiritual things, right? <clears throat> I just want to play pickleball. <laughs> you know, I just want to go for a run. I just want somebody to leave me alone. So, footnote benevolent detachment is going to save your life. Okay, benevolent detachment where you release everything and everyone to God. Okay, That's we're good. invited to do this. First Peter good. 5, okay, verse 7, cast everything on the Lord because he cares. He cares. So I have to practice benevolent detachment every day. My clients, my staff, you know, all that. Project right. meetings, exciting things. I give everything and everyone to you. You empty your soul of all the chaos and the clutter so that you can then receive something of the presence of God. Now, you asked about the supernatural graces. So <clears throat> the human heart, the heart of the believer, is the new temple. Okay, so you had the tabernacle, you had the temple, and in the Old Testament, that was where the presence of God came down and dwelt among his people, which is why you get all these psalms saying, let us go up unto the Lord, let us go experience his presence, because that was the locus for it, that was the location. But in the New Testament, God does something radical. And Paul writes about it. He says, you now are the temple of God. Because mm. this is where the presence of God dwells in the world now. And this is where the presence of God expresses itself in the world now. So <clears throat> I, got, I got all these Bible guys tracking with me going, <laughs> oh, I think that's true. Uh, <clears throat> we are now the temple of the living God. Ephesians 3, Christ dwells in your hearts. Okay, well, if that's where Christ dwells, then that's the new temple. That is the location of the presence of God in the world, okay? So the glory of the living God would fill the tabernacle, and the glory of the living God would fill the temple. The glory of the living God is meant to fill our humanity. It's the, only, it's the only thing that can empower us. It's the right. only thing that, that, that can transform our character. It's the only thing that works. But very few of us say, and this is right out of the Ephesians 3 prayer, right? Paul says, I pray to the Father, the creator of all things in heaven and on earth, that he would strengthen you out of his glorious riches by his spirit in your inmost being. So there we go. Okay. But we don't stop and ask for it and say, I need to be saturated with the beauty of creation because the glory of God fills the earth, as Isaiah says. I need to be saturated with the glory of Cana 
because when Christ turned water to wine, it says he thus revealed his glory. Mm. I, I need to be saturated with the resurrection power of the Almighty, because Paul says in Romans 6, it was by the glory of God that he raised Jesus from the dead. So your, your humanity, your being doesn't function well without a regular infusion of just the beauty of the presence of God, the, the right. splendor of it, the love, the, the goodness, the riches of it. It's not a weird thing. It's not a woo, you know, <laughs> it, 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 is the, it is all that you see in nature that you love, right? Mm. It, it, it is the goodness of God saturating your humanity. I recommend asking for it on mm. a regular basis. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know, it's it's interesting as we're kind of talking through this idea of 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 all the goodness that God has created for us, longs for us to to live into and um, experience. Again, we're faced with a messy world, right? And um, and one one of the things that you touch on is this idea of where we are focusing um, and how we are focusing our energy. And so uh, thinking of from, from a pastor's perspective, you know, there's so many um, competing narratives uh, in the world right now, you know, and they're vying for our time, they're not vying for our attention, whether it's, you know, a narrative of politics and power, narrative, um, social narratives, economic narratives, you know, whatever it might be, competing stories of belief even, all of these, all of these hot button issues that, um, you know, we live in a world of 24-7 regurgitation of everyone's opinions, right? Um, and, and oftentimes we call that news, but it's a lot of opinions, um, so many competing narratives. Um, yet there's really only one true story that we're living in. Um, can you talk to us a little bit, how, because we, we see this happening in the church as well, and even in church leadership. Um, how or maybe why do you think we are allowing ourselves to be swept up into all of these different stories? And, and how do we get back to mm. God's story? Mm. And, and again, I just, my heart just goes out to you. <laughs> like, mm. Right. Because everybody in your congregation is trying to get you to buy into their narrative. Right. And yeah. <clears throat> okay. So two thoughts um, that will be very helpful. First off, the, the, the war is for your attention and your affection. That's what the war is over. And everything is clamoring for your attention. It's trying to get your attention. This and this and this and this. So if we're trying to stay rooted in the story of God, it, which is the true story of the world. I mean, every human heart is beating right now because Jesus Christ is sustaining it. Right. The sun rose this morning because Jesus Christ is sustaining it. Like the story of God is the story of the world. Right, right. Okay. But um, therefore, you have to, however much time you give to news, media, you know, intake of the competing narratives, right? The circus of narratives right now, you need to give equal time to the story of God. And this will just help you measure kind of your day. So if you're cruising through your newsfeed and you blow, you know, 20 minutes on that, you're going to need 20 minutes at some point in the, in the day in the Psalms. Right. 20 minutes in the Gospels, 20 minutes in the book of Revelation. I mean, you're, you're going to need to get back or like a good, you know, good Bible podcast, good teaching, that kind of thing. It's just a matter of attention. What has captured your attention what, for most of your day? What? Because I guarantee you it's the world. Because right. it's just, oh, yeah, it's the chaos, right? Okay, but let me add something else. Because you asked, why do we do that? <clears throat> so the allure is always the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is always the temptation. Wow. Because, oh man, because we, I'm, I, we feel like if we can understand more, if we can know 
more, we will have a sense of mastery. We will have a sense of control. It's a very seductive thing and it is untrue. Okay. The tree of life is the tree that we need. Okay. That's good. Oh man. And That's so, so good. Just be aware of the pull in you. No, no, no. It's knowledge. It's, I got to be up on what's happening in Ukraine or I'm not going to look educated to my congregation. I need to, I need to be up on what just happened in Palestine and, and, and like, okay, just be aware of the pull that knowledge will secure you. Knowledge will give you control. It's a lie. <laughs> but it's very seductive because because we exchange the reach for the knowledge, you know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We exchange that for God. I need you. Right. I need you. I need you. I need the tree of life. You are the vine. I'm just a branch. I have got to receive from you the life that I need, even at the expense of not being as informed as certain members of my congregation. Yeah, that's good. That's that's fascinating because um, I, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people where where people defend, um, you know, watching 24-7 news because, well, I need to be aware of what's going on in the world around us. I mean, that's that's a responsible thing. You know, I mean, like it's this this idea of of awareness and and, and it's almost um they almost try to make you feel naive or out of touch if you don't know every nuance of every single thing that was the breaking news that particular day, which um, just just that contrast um, and the truth of that contrast uh, between the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, I think is powerful because that, that, that really brings that entire um, tension between those two things and it makes it very, very clear what it is that God is asking us to do, yeah. how God is inviting us to live in yes. his presence. Yes. And again, let me relieve you of a burden that the pressure on the modern pastor is to be a global pundit, that you mm. are an expert commentator on all global affairs. That is not your job. Right. Again, That's I, right. I, I want to relieve you of that. It's not your job. Your job is to know God and to help your people into you know, his transforming life, okay? To disciple your people into his presence. You are meant to know God. And, and the expertise of the world thing has just been saddled on you and it's crushing and it will exhaust you because, hey, How's that going, by the way? Right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right? How's yeah. that working? Yeah. Yeah. Not so much, right? Not so much. Yeah. That's that's interesting. That kind of kind of brings us into this idea of um, you know, you mentioned earlier, uh, we see, you know, kind of an alarming um rate of pastors who are kind of raising their hand and saying, I'm considering walking away from ministry. I'm I, I you know, I I'm I'm considering just, just stepping away altogether. And as you kind of um, think through that, I mean, a lot of what you've shared, you know, these, these tensions, this weight, these expectations that are placed on us, um, what encouragement do you have for the pastor of a local congregation as they are contemplating their calling and whether they can sustain life in ministry uh, because oftentimes it's it's not only having a toll personally on the pastor but on their spouse their kids their family I and mean, there, there's a lot engaged a lot involved and a lot of pastors are asking the question you know they're saying i love jesus and i'm willing to suffer for jesus you know mm -hmm. that that's mm -hmm. okay but when when is enough enough or you know how how do i navigate this what would you say to that pastor yes <clears throat> Yeah, this is such a good show. This is, <laughs> um, okay. So first, um, you do need to ask, is this sustainable? Is my current way of life, all that's expected of me, you just look at it and go, 
will I have the same level of joy and energy 10 years from now? Mm. Will I? <clears throat> will I even love God 10 years from now because of all this? You know, right. um, it's fair to ask yourself, is this sustainable? And, and, to, and this would be something to do with God, with your spouse, mm. um, and with a couple trusted friends. I, I don't recommend it's your elder board. Right. Okay? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> is this sustainable? And, and then to ask Jesus, is there another way? Is there another way? Are, are there some things that I actually can offload that would make this more sustainable? just across the whole, you know, battlefront of of your life. Are there some things that would I could offload, honestly, that would make it more sustainable? And it's so important to ask Jesus that because we're involved in a lot of things out of fear. Mm. We're involved in a lot of things because of what people would say if we didn't, you know. But Jesus might say you actually don't need to be on that committee. Right. You don't need to go to those conferences. You don't actually have to, you know, uh, he shocked me at how much margin he has actually been able to give back, Jesus has, into my life by things that I just thought were non-negotiable. I'm like, no, you don't understand. You know? Right, right. That's okay. good. So assessing with Christ, it, how do we make this sustainable? How do we make this sustainable? But, but now I'm going to pause. <clears throat> I need to mention something else that's operating. So there is a, the, the forces of the kingdom of darkness, um, you know, the hatred in the world, gadzooks, there's so much hatred. You can't even put, you can't even say something casually without people just jumping right, all right, over it. And exactly. that, you know, they're like, whoa, okay. So <laughs> hatred, <clears throat> um, there's a lot of death just death in the world and death that we're hearing about. And, um, but there is also a kind of desolation. Mm. And, and as a therapist, I began to notice this in my clients. And then I began to notice it in my staff. And then I began to notice it in myself. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second. There, there is a global phenomenon now of tapping out, mm. of, of giving in, throwing in the towel, whether it's a marriage, a career, people just giving up on their health. Right. You know, or 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 falling back into their addictions and 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 all of that, you know, self harm behavior. There is this desolation in the world that that is coming against our hearts, which is why it's so beautiful to have the glory of the living God, just the resplendent presence of God, fill your heart because it fortresses you against this stuff. But just to be aware, your decisions right now are being influenced by things that are operating globally by the kingdom of darkness what he's up to in the world and and so to say jesus i don't want that to influence my decision making right now because the temptation is going to be no this isn't sustainable i'm out of here right right whoa, 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 hang on hang on um jesus help me to assess this without darkness and desolation getting into my heart and, and into my life and into even my perspective on my calling. I got into this because I love you. I, I got into this because I love God, right? That's everyone's, right, right? right? Yeah, okay. The glory of the living God will strengthen you against desolation in the world and this pull to tap out. And, and so I, I just add that as a footnote. Because it'll it'll be hard to think clearly without being aware of that. Yeah, that's good. That that that's really powerful. And and just the idea of of taking the time to to process. Um, I think a, a lot of times, and especially coming through what we've been coming through, right? Because there's so much being thrown at us, and there's just a, a heaviness, um, a weightiness mm -hmm. of, of, of expectation and, mm -hmm. and uncertainty, and we feel responsibility, but we don't even know all the, you know, it's, it's that whole navigating all of that. And, and just the, the idea of stopping, pausing, processing, praying, assessing, 
um, before making yes. uh, a decision. Yeah, um, I mean that's just that's one of the yeah. things. I, I think right now uh, vulnerability is is high. Um, I know th- that you touch on that. You know the idea of disappointment leading to disillusionment, which just kind of makes us extremely vulnerable to the enemy. Um, and so that the vulnerabilities are high, and, and we see this not only with pastors who are kind of burning out and tapping out and stepping away, but pastors who are um, making very, very poor decisions, right? Um, you know, moral failures that, that hurt themselves, hurt their family, hurt the church, hurt the witness of the church. Um, and so, so talk to us a little bit about the, the correlation between everything we're experiencing and those vulnerabilities and, mm, and how we need mm. to be attentive to that. Mm-hmm. It, it is so good, Jason. Can we just say it's okay that you're vulnerable? Mm. Like, like you're, not, right. not, you're not meant to be Superman. Right, right. But there's the expectations again, like that, that, that the pastor is somehow impervious. Right. That they don't have a humanity to them. Like your humanity is real. Your vulnerabilities are real. And they matter, okay? So you have to say that. It is very, very important on a regular basis to assess where you're feeling vulnerable and just just where are you going for comfort, okay? That's a really simple question. Where do you go for comfort, okay? What are you doing to comfort these days? Are you daydreaming about vacations? Are you daydreaming about quitting? Are you (laughs) you daydreaming about another woman? Um, just notice it and go, wow, my soul is really longing for some solace and some care and to invite Christ into the vulnerability in the live moment. Don't mm-hmm. wait till your personal retreat four months from now. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Way late. Like in the day, in the moment where you feel the vulnerability, oh, Jesus, I need your solace. I need your care. And, and, and a lot of us, yeah, we're willing to suffer for long periods of time, but you actually can't do that as a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Okay. You, you have to have solace. You have right. to have mercy. You have to have comfort in that. And, and God, God is available, but you will need... <clears throat> Augustine said, we must empty ourselves of all that fills us so that we may be filled with that of which we are currently empty, which by which he meant the presence of God. Mm. Benevolent detachment, gang. Benevolent detachment. Benevolent meaning it's not cynicism. It's not anger. I'm not checked out. It's not resignation. In love, I release everything to you, God. I can't carry these people. I can't, I can't carry the global news. I can't. I release it so that my soul might receive some solace. And then I would say on a pretty regular basis, what do you do for mercy? Where do you go for mercy? I I recommend beauty and I recommend nature. Mm -hmm. So like, listen to beautiful music, watch beautiful things, you know, nature shows on whales and stuff. Like just let beauty minister to your soul and get out in nature. Take a walk every day. Go to the beach, get get somewhere, go to your garden where just nature and its healing properties can bring you solace and comfort. Otherwise, you're going to go find comfort. Right. And if you're not finding it in healthy ways, you'll go find it in some way. It's going to end up, you know, blowing things up. Yeah, that's good. That's good, brother. John, I so appreciate your, your wisdom and, and the benevolent detachment and the distinction you make about that benevolent detachment, where, where it's rooted in and the heart behind it, mm-hmm. um, I think is, is um, so vital right now for us in the world in which we're living and yeah. the things that we're navigating. So I certainly yeah. appreciate you making the time to be with us here on Front Stage, oh. Backstage. And, yeah. and uh, uh, this, this new book um, that you do have releasing, uh, Resilient, um, when is that available? How can people um, get that book? And how can they connect with you if, yeah. if they want to follow up with you? Yeah, so book comes out uh, 1st of June. Um, I recommend the audio book, by the way, because in the audio book, I'm able to do this. I'm able to be more conversational and riff 
and I, I go off on tangents and stuff. Nice. <laughs> but most importantly, at the end of each chapter, both in the book and in the audio book, I lead you in prayer. I lead you into being an amphibian and into tapping into things like, oh, the glory, the, the resplendent presence of God filling your being. So yeah, that's going to be super helpful for folks. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And if they want to connect with, with you, can they find you on, on social media? or? Yeah, yeah. Well, just look for Wild at Heart. We're, yep. we're wildatheart.org. And if you type in John Eldridge Wild at Heart, you'll find your way to us. Awesome. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank yeah. you, brother. Thank you so I'm much for, again for being here. Appreciate your heart. Appreciate your words of wisdom. I know it'll be encouraging to, to pastors and ministry leaders. Oh, I truly hope so. I, this has been an honor. Yeah, my heart goes out to all of you. Awesome, brother. Well, thank you so much. God bless yeah. you, my friend. Thanks, man. Okay. Now, before you go, I want to remind you of an incredible free resource that our team puts together every single week to help you and your team dig more deeply and maximize the conversation that we just had. This is the weekly toolkit that we provide. And we understand that it's one thing to listen or watch uh, an episode, but it's something entirely different to actually take what you've heard, what you've watched, what you've seen and apply it to your life and to your ministry. You see, Front Stage Backstage is more than just a podcast or YouTube show about ministry leadership. We are a complete resource to help train you and your entire ministry team as you seek to grow and develop in life and ministry. Every single week, we provide a weekly toolkit, which has all types of tools in it to help you do just that. Now you can find this at pastorserve.org slash network. That's pastorserve.org slash network. And there you'll find all of our shows, all of our episodes, and all of our weekly toolkits. Now inside the toolkit are several tools, including video links and audio links for you to share with your team. There are resource links about different resources and tools that were mentioned in the conversation, several other tools, but the greatest thing is the Ministry Leaders Growth Guide. Our team pulls key insights and concepts from every conversation with our amazing guests. And then we also create engaging questions for you and your team to consider and process, providing space for you to reflect on how that episode's topic relates to your unique context at your local church, in your ministry, and in your life. Now you can use these questions in your regular staff meetings to guide your conversation as you invest in the growth of your ministry leaders. You can find the weekly toolkit at pastorserve.org slash network. We encourage you to check out that free resource. Until next time, I'm Jason Day, encouraging you to love well, live well, and lead well. God bless.